conservative politics are both super pro-military, super pro-police, and anti-big government. Because the part of government that they want is the part that secures their rights. Not the part that confers rights on everybody. Things like basic social safety nets, things like education systems, themes like infrastructure. I'll pay for that stuff myself. I don't need, no, because then somebody else is going to get it. But you better protect my property and my investments and secure my loans from the bank. When we take on an ideology of rights and we center our, our way of being together through a lens of rights, it produces an inherently individualistic society. It produces an inherently narcissistic society. It's all about me and what am I owed? What do I deserve? And I only invest in creating social structures that guarantee outcomes for me. I will build the vending machine as long as it takes my money and has the snacks in it that I want. Does this like basically make sense? Are we kind of on the same page here? Now, I know there's going to be some disagreement, especially from those amongst you who are really big proponents of this idea of the, the, the almost like the theology of rights and this desire for human rights. And I'm just going to sadly say I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one because I've been thinking about this for a very long time and I only see human rights happen when there are powers that exert military violence in order to secure those rights. Bosnia, Kosovo, Rwanda, Darfur, I could go on. Those rights only came into being when military powers were willing to intervene from outside and stop the Khmer Rouge. Now that's a deeply nihilistic perspective and I just want to name that that's where I'm starting here in this place. But we, in a culture of rights, are building a culture of responsibility, which is a very different thing. Now, I also did some word study on this because I was like, ooh, responsibility. That sounds fun, but it's got an I, not an A. And there's a reason for that because it doesn't actually mean that. Your responsibility isn't about your ability to respond. Right? There's this old maxim, this old saw that we use in the church that says, God equips the called, God does not call the equipped. And if you look at the history of the Hebrew people, and you look at the people that were called to be prophets to speak the word of God, they not only did not know what they were doing, but they kind of didn't want to do it. <laughs> the story of Jonah is the story of a dude who got called and said, no thanks, and got swallowed by a really big fish until he finally turned around and did it begrudgingly. He hated the people he was called to save. But he went anyway and said, you bunch of, you don't even deserve the word I'm gonna give you, but you're all screwed if you don't change your mind. And you know what they did? They changed their mind. And you know how Jonah felt about it? He was pissed. He was like, I knew you were gonna do this. I knew that you were gonna get me to say the thing and they were gonna change their mind and they were gonna get your grace. And this is a bunch of BS. <laughs> See, Jonah was in the world of rights, but he was called to speak a word of responsibility. You do the same thing with Moses. He's like, I don't, I can't even talk. And God's like, well, you got this brother Aaron. Do you have any more excuses? We'll work this stuff out, right? Same with Jeremiah, same with Amos. You can walk through the list. Nobody wants to do the work of being a prophet. Nobody wants to do the work of speaking the word, except for the people that are 17 and have lots of things to say. <laughs> but you know what God does to them? Humbles the shit out of them when they start doing it. Thank God, praise the Lord. Our responsibilities are not about our ability to respond, unless you take your ability to, re to respond to mean your willingness. It's not that we have to be made ready to receive the Spirit. We were made ready to receive the Spirit. 
You were formed by your creator to receive the spirit of the Lord to be at work in you, to call you to do the thing, to see the thing, to respond to the thing. In fact, the word responsibility comes from Latin and it's a compound word that basically the two parts of it are back pledge. To, to, to basically to respond to a commitment. And in the Christian world, what Jesus has been trying to do with his people that's different than what was happening in the Greek world. See, in the Greek world, uh, all things were shared among friends. That's a quote from Aristotle. All things are shared amongst friends, but there's a sense of reciprocity about it. There's a sense of you give and I give and we share everything, but we're equals and we have basically the same amount of stuff. And so it's like, you know, uh, trading pants with your best friend if you guys happen to fit in the same pants size. Um, but Jesus is trying to say something different. He's trying to say, no, none of this shit is yours. Whose is it? It's God's. Everything you have is from God. What did you make? What did you create? Even your thoughts and opinions and ideas, well, guess where they came from? They came from other people who loved you enough to share them with you, who uh, deigned you worthy to hear a word you didn't want to hear when you were 17 and you've been holding on to, who offered you out of the abundance of their heart, which they then received from those other shoulders they're standing on and standing on and standing on and standing on. You ain't got nothing that's yours. In fact, the real meaning of stewardship is to caretake for something that is on loan to you. Right? When we are stewards of this church, it's not our church. It's kind of like we're in the middle. We receive this gift from our ancestors, and we are preparing ourselves to become ancestors to the next generation. How are we going to steward? How are we going to manage? How are we going to caretake? And it's not just the building. It's not just the money. It's the ethos. It's the message. These guys in Acts didn't own anything. They didn't have churches and endowments. Well, they sold their stuff and they pooled some resources together because they knew that they're gonna to need to keep the message of the resurrection going. And they need to care for their people because their people are really the resource. We are the resource. In a world of rights, we are becoming people of responsibilities. I learned a new phrase from my wife when I was talking to her about preparing for this sermon. She said, oh, that sounds a lot like outcome independence. Have any of you heard the term outcome independence before? It's kind of a beautiful psychological term. I encourage you to look it up, but I'll give you a basic summary. Um, how many of you are people that say, it is what it is? It is what it is. Why do we say it is what it is? Because it is. Because <laughs> things don't really work out the way we wanted them to, right? Things are kind of messed up still. It, it didn't, I, I intended this, but eh, it is what it is. Outcome independence is this idea that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. That you're going to input your time, energy, vision, commitment, resources. You're going to do what you're going to do. And how much control do you have of the outcome? Yeah, right? Think of all the people that you have loved and poured care and concern and compassion and time and energy on. Uh-huh. Did it not working out lead you to give less care, concern, compassion, time, and energy to others? Hopefully not. It might have changed how you gave it. I'm not talking about not having boundaries. Right? Because sometimes we give into a black hole of need and we think we're going to fix it and change it. We're going to save them and we keep doing it and it's not working. So we do it more. Outcome independence is saying, you know what? This is what I have to do. This is the work that's in front of me now. This is the next right thing. And I'm going to do it regardless of what happens. Outcome independence is a thing to look into and learn about for yourself because it will help liberate you from codependent tendencies. It will help lead you into a differentiated sense of self. Anybody who's gone through addiction work knows about this concept, whether they've heard this word or not before. 
It's this call to just do the next right thing. And this is the thing that Jesus is trying and trying and trying to teach me throughout my faith life. How do I let go of changing the world and just meet the moment here, now? How do I take all my failures, my inabilities, my uh, lack of knowledge, my lack of love that I've had in the past and let it form and shape me? That story of when I didn't say what I was supposed to say. When I didn't do what I was supposed to do, does that make me less and unworthy or does it help me know that that's a possibility the next time and I wanna choose differently? It's got a lot of relationship to growth mindset stuff, so I encourage you to look it up. In the world of rights, we are becoming a people of responsibility and that's what the church is actually for, in my opinion. That's the reason we build a building, that's the reason we have a budget, that's the reason we hire a pastor, that's the reason we do all this stuff is that we're learning how to trust in God more and let go of the outcomes as much. Are we going to solve gun violence? I don't know. I'm not going to say no, but I'm not going to say yes. But I am going to say that the next person that I meet, am I bringing my heartbreak, my grief, my frustration, my disappointment in a way that's going to lead to better connection and relationship, which is the best insulator against violence and hate and fear. The church is a place to practice trusting in God. Practice trusting that actually none of this is ours. See, those early disciples were holding all things in common, which is a huge risk. Because you don't know. If you don't anticipate uh, reciprocity, then you're just letting it go letting go of control, letting go of uh, the outcome, letting go of what's going to happen with it. And so then why are you doing it? You're doing it because there's something about trusting in God that requires us to let go. We hold on, are we really trusting in God? If we're holding on, do we really believe in God's abundance? Or do we Are we pretty still convinced that I have to scrounge and save and hold and grasp? You know, and we live in a world that amplifies messages of scarcity, that actually creates scarcity. It's part of that power mechanism that's really rooted in that fear mechanism. But here, we own this together. I mean, like literally this building, that piano, this microphone, like we own this together as members of this church. That's what it means to be a member is that you help direct the resources of this community. What I love about the United Church of Christ is that we bake that into the system. There's nobody outside of this room that gets to decide how we do this. We decide how we do this and we covenant together. We commit to being a community together, not because of uh, the value of the asset, but the value that we could leverage to do the work that we're called to do the next right thing. We're also learning how to trust God by being vulnerable with each other, by telling our stories, by risking a piece of ourselves that might not be welcome everywhere, but here, We can talk about our grief, our pain, our loss, our struggle, our fear. Be held and learn how to hold each other. And we're doing that not because of this church. I want that to be really clear. It's not because of this particular church that we're trying to build up and make amazing. That's not what Jesus was interested in. He's interested that we come here and we practice it so that we can be church more places with more people. This is just a place to practice how to be the church in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth.